about 25 years ago, um, I, I was given this this spear. And uh, what it is, if, if and, and Gerald, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the hunters in West Africa would have something like this, and uh, as they're going hunting, they would strap it onto their waist, and as they chased after an animal, they would put it together and throw it, and, and it, it's an actual hunting spear. And I got that, uh, I don't know, 25 years ago or so, from a friend of mine because he was home from Africa on missions, and I was able to take him and his two boys fishing, right? And then all of a sudden, 25 years later, one of these young boys, who's no longer a young boy, uh, walks in the door of our church. And I don't know if you know Peter and Caitlin, they're right here in the front row, uh, have been attending our church since then. And uh, of course, I didn't recognize Peter from last time I had seen him, uh, which was the day I got these. But uh, I, I, our speaker today is uh, Peter's father, Gerald. And I've known Gerald since the late 70s. He has been um, a career missionary. I've heard him speak many times. You will, you will know his passion as he speaks. He's a guy that um, is very passionate for, for people who are living and dying without Jesus. And uh, Ger Gerald raised his family in West Africa and the Ivory Coast and in Burkina Faso and then moved to Central Europe in Poland and Hungary and the Balkan Islands. And now uh, Gerald and his wife Dorothy live uh, and uh, he oversees the regional developers in Europe and Middle East and, and in Asia and oversees those missionaries and the work that's happening there. So, Gerald, come on up here. I want to be able to pray for you and, uh, and uh, look forward to what God has to say through you this morning. Let's pray. God, as we go to your word this morning, inspire us with the truth of who you are. We want to see Jesus. We want to hear of great things that you, Father, are doing in our world. Inspire us to engage in your mission. And may we not see Gerald this morning, may we see Jesus. Amen. Hey, thanks so very much, Pastor Dave. Great memories of floating little sacks of roe down the rivers over here. Now my sons out surpassed me in terms of fishing. And thanks so very much for days gone by. Delight to be here. And we came here, uh, and thank you so much, Community for Church, for uh, being so welcoming to Peter and Caitlin. They speak so highly of you guys. So uh, thank you for doing what you do. And uh, remember, I came here for the first time, and they gave me one of those first-time things. You know one of these water bottle things that says Sable Community Church? So I'm actually living in Whitby right now, and we go to this fitness place 5, 5.30 in the morning. Believe it or not, that's, that's weird, eh? And you go to these uh, cycle classes, spin classes, and hit classes, and I take that bottle along, and hey, on occasion, it's just left over there, and they pick it up, and Sobel Community Church, what's that? Hey, get a chance to chat with them. And it's a segue to having amazing conversations with all kinds of people, and we're actually having 75 of these people that we just journey life together with at this fitness place in the month of June, and so looking forward to that. So we think of you most mornings. Hey, isn't it nice to see spring come along? So uh, th just before I was coming here, uh, pulled the curtain. You know, the robins are there. And there you see the pool, the neighbor. And he's out there, and he's just like, should I take this lid off or not, you know? Everybody is itching to get into the pool, which reminded me of, what, last year or the year before, our grandkids, Micah and Christian, well, and Brielle as well, standing at the edge of the pool. And then they're looking at you, which made me remember Peter and Jonathan when they first were in that pool in West Africa. I couldn't help but remember, you know, they had the little Speedos on. No, th them, not me. Don't, don't go there. <laughs> and, you know, with the little goggles and the floppy things. And I was in the pool there, and I just like, come on. And I'm thinking, you're a Canadian. You've got to learn how to swim. Peter, Jonathan, you know. And they're looking at you, and their little lip is quivering away, and they're just like... 
And they looked down in six inches. It, it can't be done. Everything screaming in their hearts. And I said, it can't be done. And you just say, don't be afraid. Don't look at that water. Just look at that. Look at my eyes. Okay, you got that? Now jump. And finally, that courage overcomes that fear. And they jump. Grandparents, if you want the best hug from your grandchildren, take them to the pool the first time. They come up and whoo, hold on with all their heart. Now the young guys are in their teens. Come back to Canada. Bob's Lake, 25 foot high cliff. It's another story. Dad's treading water in this lake called Bob's Lake. Come on, Pete. Come on, John. Stop being such a wuss. Jump! And I'm thinking, glad it's you. And there you are. You're treading water. And Peter was a little reticent. And then his second, well, his brother, all of a sudden, the quiet one, shoots out into the middle of the air. And this silent scream and <laughs> hits the water. They see the bubbles coming up. They say you can't touch. All of a sudden, that head pierces that water. And there's this sense of elation that fear was overcome. Question. Anybody here in this congregation ever been afraid? You're a pretty honest congregation here, Pastor. 2,000 years ago, there was another incident. Twelve men, strong men, accustomed to the water, as you are over here. They find themselves in a boat. And this is what happened. Listen to the narrative. Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples go into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up to a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because of the wind. Now during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, listen, walking on the lake. But when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It's I. Don't be afraid. Well, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afeard. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And then the two of them climbed into the boat, and the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, truly, you are the Son of God. Twelve disciples in the boat. All were afraid. And Jesus says, Take courage. It's I. Don't be afraid. Peter says to Jesus, if it's really you, command me to get out of this boat and walk to you on water. 
You ever seen somebody walk on water in the summer? And so Peter, he focused, he fixed his eyes on Christ. Fear gripped the hearts of so many of them. And that day there was one risk taker. There were 11 boat huggers. Peter was scared. The 11 were afraid. But what was the difference? For Peter, his fear propelled him to Christ. And friends, that's the truth. The strongest thing in any person's life at any time is that which we fix our eyes upon. What are you fixing your eyes upon this morning? Is it Christ? So only the one who was the risk taker and who focused on Jesus experienced that miracle. The other 11, they saw it, but never saw it firsthand. But you know, Peter there sits there and he's out there on the churn and the swirl of that water, that seething heap of water, and he walks in and he's looking at Christ and then all of a sudden he's gripped by that mass of water and his heart sinks and he immediately starts to sink and he cries out, best prayer you can ever pray in your life. That's all you get out of today is this. Lord, save me. I'm sunk. I can't do this. And you think Jesus sits there and says, well, you sucker, you just didn't look. You didn't have faith. You know, you like suffer a little bit. No. What do we read? Immediately, Jesus reaches out his hand and catches him. And he does that for anyone who call on him. And you see, there was that conversation with Jesus that started to happen which became a defining moment in his life. And that's what I want to speak to you about today. Conversations with Christ, which become defining moments. The two of them get back into the boat. The wind dies down. And everybody says, like, who is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him and he walks on water. And all the fears of that which come from the lake, deep in Gennesaret. Oh, yes, but he overcomes. Who is this? Who is this man? Quite a question. You know, normally when someone dies, their impact in this world immediately begins to recede. I've done many funerals. But you know, John Ortberg in his book, Who Is This Man?, mentions that 13 years ago, our world had Bob Hope, Johnny Cash, and Steve Jobs. Now we have no Jobs, no Cash, and no Hope. <laughs> and if you didn't laugh, ask the seniors. But you know, Jesus inverted this normal human trajectory. Jesus' impact was greater a hundred years after his death than during his life. It was greater still after 500 years. And after a thousand years, his legacy laid the foundation for much of Europe. And after 2,000 years, he has more followers in more places throughout this world than ever before. And some, even in The Economist, <laughs> Uh, states 2.3, I say, billion people that in some way follow Christ. Those that were in the center, perhaps this part of the world, now find themselves in the peripheries, but huge growth in the church in these parts of the world. Amazing what Christ has done. <laughs> Why? We just celebrated that. He's alive. It's amazing the impact Christ, of Christ in world history. Christ, he was born in the first century, but he belongs to all centuries. Christ, he was born a Jew, yet he belongs to all races. Christ was born in Bethlehem, but yet he belongs to the whole world, for God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son. 
Christ. He is the hinge of history. He's the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He mastered life. He conquered death. He is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Jesus, light of the world. And He never becomes weary or weak. And He is your best friend. And He comes to us. So friends, this morning, what's so unique about Christianity? Why are we here this morning? It's summed up in one word. One person. Christ. If we have Christ, we have it all. If we don't, not much. William Wilberforce, who helped abolish the slave trade in the British Parliament, said this, and I quote, If there is no passionate love for Christ at the center of everything, we will only jingle and jangle our way across this world, merely making a noise as we go. The present pontiff in the Sistine Chapel on the very first day, he gave a homily to all the cardinals around him. He made a very interesting statement at the beginning. He said this, and I quote, If we do not confess Christ, what would we be? We would end up a compassionate NGO. And what would happen? We would be like children building sandcastles by the seashore. The tide will come in and all will fall away. And Jesus had a conversation, real Christ, and he said, Take courage. It's I. Don't be afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, and perhaps that's what you're saying this morning, and so what? If that's really true, what? If it's you, command me to come out of my boat of security. And then you hear that voice of Christ say, Come, follow me. His name was Dr. Patrick Kennedy. It was in the late 1950s. He was a physician, a pediatrician, and an obstetrician, a person of renown. And he wanted to do one of these, what I think you folks know, a short-term trip. It took a little longer in those days. Had to bob in a little boat. And, and what happened was uh, he left North America, and he came to what's now considered the Arabian Peninsula, the seven countries like Kuwait, Bahrain, uh, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Oman, Yemen, and Saudi Arabia. He landed over here in the country of United Arab Emirates. You probably have heard of the city of Abu Dhabi or Dubai. It was Abu Dhabi, he actually, he landed in. And from there, he took an eight or nine hour trip over sand dunes and whatnot to a little town called Al Ain, A L A I N. And you can check it out on your smartphone later. <laughs> and when he arrived there, the ruler, Sheikh Zayed, was found in his Bedou tents with his dagger in the belts, Kondura, surrounded by, yes, camels and goats and lots of sand and a few rocks. And at the edge of Oman, he said, Dr. Kennedy, you've come. Thank you. We have a problem. What's the problem? Infant mortality, three in ten of our children die before the age of five. Not to speak of mothers, daughters, sisters who succumb. Dr. Kennedy, I would like for you to come and set up a clinic, a little hospital for our people because this is unbearable Dr. Kennedy was somebody who had loved Christ and did love Christ 
It's that that compelled him to go over the seas to that place. To a people group, for nobody in those days knew about that people group whatsoever. The Emiratis. And there he is, asked by the sheikh, Sheikh Zayed, would you set up a hospital? I mean, he was doing the two-week thing, right? He wasn't a, an intelligent person. And he says, well, let me, let me pray. That's always a good religious thing to say, you know? Let me pray. No, <laughs> in his heart. He went back to his adobe hut. And there, friends, started to have a conversation with Jesus, which became a defining moment. But Lord, he, he's asked me to come here to set up a clinic. Like the waves of sand here, like, can't be done. Like, not only that, I'm at the zenith, I'm at the apex of my career. What would my colleagues and my group think? Has he lost it? I mean, do your little ditty for a bit, but, but actually go there. And Lord, I'd have to learn the language of these people. This is a long-term commitment. I'd have to go there for years. And who knows about those people? Who even gives a rip about them? <laughs> Jesus probably said, frankly, I do. Yeah, but, you know, I, I'd have to ask my wife to come here. She's a doctor, too. She's got a career, you know. And, you know, the temperatures, they get up to 52 degrees. I know, I've been there. Celsius during the summer, July, August, unbelievable. It's like opening your oven, having a fan blow out. And she's got the most lovely skin. And you know, no amount of oil of Olay will help. <laughs> Not there. <laughs> no. Come on. And what about my CPP? And you know, be reasonable here. Come on. I mean, why would I just... I'm, I'm, I'm secure in this boat. Why would I step out there? I mean, is that what... You would want me to do? Silence. And probably the Lord said, anything else to say? And at the base of so many of these questions, fear had gripped his heart. And that at last he said, Lord, if it's you, if it's you that wants me to go to a place like this, command me to get out of my little boat of security and comfort and ease and that which is familiar to me and follow you. And then there's that still small voice, a deep, peaceful, small voice that says, Patrick, take courage. It's I. Don't be afraid. Come, follow me. Simple words, profound words, words that become defining moments. He actually moved there in the late 50s. And he started to work. They set up a little clinic. It's called Oasis Hospital. You can text that. In Al Ain. And before you know it, within a few years, some other physicians came out and helped. Some nurses and it was a beautiful work that happened over there. And mothers were cared for, and daughters and sisters. And the infant mortality rate plummeted 
so much so that it hit the norms in the world. We arrived over 20 years ago in that particular part of the world. Dr. Kennedy had left. Not many people followed Christ, even though a hospital had been established. He saw only four in his lifetime. And you say, what a waste. No, he lived to be forgotten, so Christ would be remembered. Ah, that's quotable. Really? You mean to do all that and to be forgotten? Oh, nothing done in the name of Christ is ever forgotten. And to do the right thing is always the right thing to do. And so there we were at the bottom of the Burj Al Arab, the Seven Star Hotel. Carl Sherbrooke, one of the guys that replaced Dr. Kennedy, said, You've got to come out and see this. What happened? We were about to leave, and Sheikh Zayed, oh yeah, minor detail. What happened in the late 1950s in that part of the world? Huh? Sing out. Or oh, the Suez, yeah, but... Ah, oh, thank you. Black gold. Minor detail. And now what happened? <laughs> There's not a building in this lovely country of Canada uh, that is as nice as some of the palaces of Sheikh Zayed the other rulers. The Sheikh wants to see you. What can I give you? After all these years, we haven't thanked you. And not only that, when nobody even cared about us, you came to this part of the world and you loved us with the love of Christ. And you cared for our families. And you know what? We, we would like to do something. Carl was there and he says, oh, fear gripped his heart and he says, let's go for it. In a part of the world where it was illegal to have any church, it, he said, would you give us some land? Come back in a week. He came back. He says, I grant you land on a hill called Jebel Ali. And so we're finding ourselves in that car going out to this 12 miles in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so we thought, we said, we should really ask for another piece of land that, you know, is in part, like closer to Dubai or something. Friends, right now they're building the world's largest airport with six parallel runways right beside that church property. And by the way, at the time when we were there, there was just a little congregation, well, half this size, only maybe 125 people. And we would have three services in a little villa. And all of a sudden, we had this opportunity. The ruler gives us this land for free. And he says, we want you to start building. So how should we build? So thankful you're working at the building. But well, oh man, we don't have much money or anything. In faith, we got out of the boat, took the step, built a building worth $3 million, which we thought, oh no. It was bought and paid for in three years. And now, I spoke there a little while ago, 21 congregations. In that building, 11,000 Chinese construction workers came to know Christ. People from all over the world. People from that part of the world. Tons of them coming to Christ in a phenomenal way. And that place is called Dubai Evangelical Christian Community. If we can have the next image. Uh, so, uh, about four years ago, uh, the son of Sheikh Zayed uh, is in touch. And he says, you know, Oasis Hospital, too small. You've got to build something bigger. So I'm just thinking, oh. He says, get the architects. So the architects started to design $40 million dollars. He says, I said, think big, think bold, huh? Eighty million dollars. I said, think big, think bold. hundred and twenty-five. Don't start sweating. I'm not here to ask for your own. <laughs> I can see the look, you know. <laughs> Got our builder. <laughs> Two hundred million dollars. And this little hospital, amazing hospital, was built. Check it out on the internet. Al Ain Hospital. 
And in the very front of that hospital, you will see a big, huge sign, not only that with the pictures of all those who came before and did that work, but it says this, to provide top quality international health care, listen, with the love and compassion of Jesus Christ. Next image, please. There's Dr. Kennedy, his wife, Sheikh Zayed, the little guy that just dropped 200 million, and another one. Uh, next image, please. And that's where 11,000 Chinese, uh, thousands and thousands of other people came and come even on Friday mornings. Uh, next image, please. And here's another church in Abu Dhabi, right beside the Ministry of Education. This one has 54 congregations that meet. You say, how does it happen? Well, it's a good-sized building, but you have lots of rooms, and you don't invite long-winded speakers because you're in and out in an hour. <laughs> and the same story happens over and over. And people from all over the world are building up those amazing buildings in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And there's a young lady. She works in a factory with a number of other Chinese workers. She works six days a week, 12 hours a day in this factory with all the other colleagues. We're invited to go to this little meeting. It's under a street lamp. At 10 o'clock at night she wants to give her testimony she said three months ago I wanted to end it I've been here for five years I work day and night I send the money back I find that my husband's run off with somebody else and my little boy's not cared for and the grass is growing up around the place I'm crushed I'm shattered and my contract doesn't let me I have no hope in this life but my colleagues told me to come here and three months ago three months ago I heard this crazy story that there is a God that actually cares and says no matter what problems you have no matter even if others leave you and forsake you, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I will be with you to the end of the day. And my presence will be with you. And I go with you. And I'm here tonight, she says, through translation, <sighs> that Christ has changed my life. And I've got to stop with the stories, for the stories are myriad. Invite me back, Pastor, because I can tell you all about northern Iraq. The clock tells me I need to do otherwise. I sum up by saying this. Fear can grip our hearts. Fear for living for Christ. Here, in this part of the world. But you know, conversations with Jesus become defining moments. And Jesus is as alive today as 2,000 years ago, in the 50s, and yesterday. I don't know where you're at this morning. Perhaps you come to church, but you haven't had a conversation, re like really, with Jesus for a while. That's okay. Today is the beginning of a great new day. Have that conversation with grace. Or perhaps you're here this morning for the first time and you've never had a conversation with Jesus and you don't even know what it's about. This is most wonderful time. You say it's nuts. Everything says to trust to God I don't see. But in my heart I know that's it. And he just says come to me. Come to me with your problems and your needs and I will be more than all. Take courage. It's I, don't be afraid. Perhaps there's something in your own life and you say something happened in the past and it can never be forgiven and bitterness has gripped your life. 
You can't, but he can, and he will help. But we have the whole community over here. God has placed you a wonderful church, Sabo Community Church, to reach out to this surrounding area. But it's not only on Sunday. It's, it's all day long, isn't it? Would it be our work? Would it be at school? Would it be our neighbors? And Christ invites us. First of all, I have a conversation with him. Lord, thanks for this new day. Who should I talk to? What should I do? Wow. And if we're quiet enough, we will hear his voice and say, this is the way. Walk in it. And it becomes a defining moment. And history changes. For decisions determine destiny. And what we do in life will echo in eternity even though Dr. Kennedy lived to be forgotten, so Christ could be remembered. And the name of Christ is echoed in the hearts and lives of billions of people today. And for some, they've never heard. What an opportunity. What an opportunity to do here what happens throughout the world because Christ is ever present here. So Sabo Community Church, pastors, elders, thank you so much for what you have done, what you are doing. But as a community, it's great to get together and quietly listen to his voice and say, collectively, what should we do? To have that collective conversation with Jesus, which will be a defining moment and will echo and fountains from this place throughout the world. You say, we're just Sabo community. No. The world heads to a place like Abu Dhabi. Amazing what God will do in your heart and in the life of your church. So as you think about this in the next week, weeks, month, let the words of Christ ring in your hearts. Take courage. It's I. Don't be afraid. Come. Follow me. And see miracles happen. God bless you. And thank you.